67 years, three dozen movies. The Godzilla franchise has had some of the highest highs and lowest lows in monster cinema history. Keep watching to know which movies to include in your next Godzilla marathon. The worst of the worst is undoubtedly Godzilla. Not the original, but the American-made mess that somehow made it into theaters in 1998. Director Roland Emmerich's take on the classic kaiju tried really hard to do some cool stuff with a unique story and modern special effects, but laughable CGI prevented it from having the punch producers had hoped for. This version of Godzilla is barely seen as it hides among buildings in New York, because if there's anything Godzilla is known for, it's hiding. That and squeezing through subway tunnels for some reason. The closest thing the film has to a saving grace is Matthew Broderick, but even Ferris Bueller himself can't save this movie from being a complete blunder. Most fans would agree that the 1998 Godzilla has had a negative impact on the franchise as a whole. Ah, uh, damn. Uh, that is a negative impact. I repeat, that is a negative impact. They gave it their best shot, but Netflix definitely missed the mark when they put out their run of animated Godzilla movies. Godzilla Planet of the Monsters, Godzilla City on the Edge of Battle, and Godzilla the Planet Eater aren't as outrageously out of place in the Godzilla canon as the 1998 film, but they're certainly not quite outstanding enough to earn individual spots on this list. This trilogy tries desperately to compensate for a lack of compelling story with vibrant animation, but the drama just isn't there thanks to a lack of memorable characters. This series gives a look at a post-apocalyptic future Earth, where humans have traveled into space to escape Godzilla and other monsters' continuous destruction. The concept is compelling, and could have made for a fantastic new take on the Godzilla mythos, but the execution doesn't exactly stick the landing. Godzilla vs. Megaguirus is another example of a film that attempted to do something unique within the Godzilla universe, but came out lukewarm at best. Unlike the hulking beasts that Godzilla is typically known for fighting, the Mega Nulons featured in this entry in the Millennium series are more like a swarm of annoying mosquitoes. It's only at the end of the movie, when Godzilla faces off with the Mega Nulon queen, Megaguirus, that things actually start to get excited. The plot is mediocre at best, reworking the Millennium-era Godzilla into its own being while somehow managing to stay disconnected from every film that came before it. Add that to the infamously bad acting from the human characters, and you get one of many misguided attempts to further the franchise after the Y2K scare. Most viewers would agree that Godzilla's Revenge, also known as All Monsters Attack, isn't the worst of films, but it's a tedious watch and among the most skippable entries in the franchise. Godzilla's Revenge was geared toward small children in an attempt to find new demographics for a declining franchise. Unsurprisingly, this didn't sit well with adults. The film is from the perspective of a bullied child watching poorly cut together stock fights taken directly from earlier, better Godzilla movies. It sold well as a late 60s kid movie, but it was also a sign of the dark times ahead for the Godzilla franchise. Stock monster fights aren't awful on their own, though, so no one will blame you for watching this oddly edited string of them. With Ibira Horror of the Deep, we're moving away from the truly disliked films and getting into mixed reviews territory. The main drawback of this film is how different it is than the more traditional Godzilla movies, most notably by not including much of Godzilla at all until the end. The plot is pretty decent, though. A man loses his brother at sea, learns from a mystic that he might still be alive, and heads out on a stolen sailboat to find him only to run into a nasty, oversized lobster called Ibira. Godzilla snoozes for a while before finally doing his thing, defeating the crustacean by ripping its claws off with an assist from Mothra. The effects and quality hadn't gotten any better than the earliest films, but that's one of the things fans of Ibira like about it. It's just the major lack of Godzilla that really drives this movie down. Godzilla Tokyo SOS is a bit confusing. The plot involves Mothra showing up and telling everybody they need to get the original Godzilla's bones out of Mecha Godzilla, and lay them to rest, because it's disrespectful to use a dead lizard's bones to raise a new monster. Then Godzilla shows up, not the original Godzilla, who is now inside Mecha Godzilla, but a second, newer Godzilla. And if that's not weird enough, Mothra ends up helping Mecha Godzilla for some reason, instead of going through with dismantling the mechanical beast. 
Tokyo SOS definitely wasn't as bad as some of the films that preceded it, but it's generally considered to be a lazy attempt by the producers of the Millennium films to keep up with the old rate of production. Terror of Mecha Godzilla was the last Godzilla film in what many consider to be the tail end of a declining franchise, at least before its resurrection in 1984. By this point, Godzilla movies had largely moved away from horror fare and into the realm of bizarre creations seemingly conjured from the mind of a six-year-old. Terror of Mecha Godzilla bombed at the box office, but it has its defenders. Most of the love for this movie can be traced to the return of veteran director Ishiro Honda, the man behind the original 1954 Godzilla and several of its sequels. Honda didn't save the movie entirely, but he did manage to give it the feel of a Godzilla flick of decades past. Terror of Mecha Godzilla was Honda's final directorial effort, and far from his best contribution to the franchise, but it was clear that his passion for the monster had never faded, even after 21 years. If Rotten Tomatoes' scoring system is to be trusted, then Godzilla Final Wars is as mediocre as a movie can be, weighing in at a perfect 50%. It's part of the millennium era, in which overarching narrative was largely abandoned in favor of pure spectacle and bizarre twists. Final Wars was certainly unique, but that wasn't necessarily a good thing. The film might be hit or miss, but it sure is fun. A trove of classic monsters and aliens descends on the Earth, leaving Godzilla to save the day. Classic stylings with modern effects bring the action to life, but the acting of the human characters is bad enough to ruin any suspension of disbelief. Godzilla Against Mechagodzilla is another mostly unremarkable film from the millennium era, but it distinguishes itself by being the first movie in the franchise in which women are truly essential to the narrative. Kaiju aren't just for boys, after all. The film also had a more progressive and diverse cast of characters, which the franchise had been trending towards since the 90s. The Mechagodzilla suit featured in this film is polarizing among fans, some think the newer design is a worthy evolution, while others seem to think it should have kept its classic look. Either way you see it, you'll probably agree the plot is on the weird side. The old Godzilla is dead, a new Godzilla has risen to take the former's place, and now the old Godzilla's bones are used to create the Mecha Godzilla cyborg. At least it's still easier to follow than its direct sequel, Godzilla Tokyo SOS. Godzilla vs. Megalon may not have wowed critics past or present, but fans certainly seem to prefer it over most of the films of the millennium era. This film is still a versus title from the downturned Showa era of the franchise, but it was better than most at the time, even though it was being aggressively marketed toward children in a desperate bid to keep the rubber suit filled. Although franchise revenues were constantly dwindling at the time, Godzilla vs. Megalon made relatively decent money at the box office. Much of its success was thanks to efficient marketing involving the new character Jet Jaguar, whose design was the result of a fan contest that Toho held the previous year. Thankfully, Godzilla vs. Megalon actually feels like a Godzilla film, and for that, it earned itself a place at number 25. In a confusing twist of fate, some people were actually disappointed that Godzilla 2000 wasn't a direct sequel to the 1998 American version. For the majority of fans, however, it was a breath of fresh air in comparison. Godzilla 2000 had many of the stylings of the older films, giving viewers the version of the King of Monsters they feared had been lost to the new world of computer-generated imaging, even though there's still plenty of bad CGI to behold. The story is also off. For some reason, Godzilla 2000 was disconnected from all previous Godzilla films and raised enough questions about continuity to leave anyone familiar with the series with a lingering sense of confusion. All in all, though, it was a decent movie that blended modern animatronics with a suit we were pleased to see hadn't yet made it to the metaphorical trash. Mechagodzilla has most recently been seen stopping Godzilla from destroying cities, but he wasn't always written that way. In Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla, the robotic titan's first appearance in the franchise, Mechagodzilla is a robot sent by aliens to destroy Japan. Naturally, it's up to Godzilla proper to save the day. Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla gave us one of Godzilla's most iconic foes, and for that, fans can't thank it enough. We're also gifted with the so-bad-it's-good guardian monster King Caesar. That being said, it wasn't the best movie it could have been. 
The film suffers from some pacing issues and features some truly bizarre musical choices. It's also gorier than any of the previous entries in the franchise, which is a plus for some and a minus for others. When it comes to Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla, most fans have one of two opinions. Either it's one of the best Godzilla films they've ever seen, or it's barely worth watching. If you're into Godzilla because you like watching big lizards destroy things, then you'll probably enjoy this movie. After all, you get two Godzillas for the price of one. Space Godzilla is believed to be a clone of the original lizard, but with several enhancements, most notably those massive crystal spikes growing out of his back. There's some fun tension between Space Godzilla and Godzilla Jr. too, reminiscent of an abandoned child taking out his parental qualms on the sibling who got all the attention. Outside of that, though, the movie isn't very good. The psychic subplot continues from the previous films, but it doesn't have much impact on anything that actually happens. The special effects are also lacking, not quite on par with the other Heisei-era films. Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2 scored pretty high with critics, ending up with an impressive Rotten Tomatoes score of 83%. Not all fans would agree with that assessment, however. The website's audience ranking is hovering just above 70% which feels more in line with the fun factor of this film. Mechagodzilla is built from the remains of Mecha King Ghidorah, and this time is meant to be humanity's savior. The movie also introduces Godzilla Jr. Not Manila, the baby-faced creature of the past, but a younger version of Godzilla that grows up to be half as big, yet just as terrifying. The only issue fans really seem to have with the film is the updated Mechagodzilla design that lacks some of its classic elements such as the iconic finger rockets. While Mothra is often thrown into Godzilla movies just because fans like the character, she doesn't just show up for no reason in Godzilla and Mothra The Battle for Earth. Here, Mothra takes center stage as the benevolent protector of Earth. Godzilla rampages, Batra falls from the sky to teach the world a lesson, and Mothra joins in the fight to stop Godzilla, eventually sealing him under the sea. Then, Mothra takes off to tour the universe for some reason or another. The effects in this movie are pretty great. Mothra looks cooler than ever before, with bigger wings and better coloring. There really aren't too many negatives about this movie, but there aren't many highlights either. It's a good Godzilla film, but nothing groundbreaking. The battle between King Kong and Godzilla, in whatever form it might take, is probably the most iconic of all the kaiju fights in the genre. The warm-blooded primate versus the sea-dwelling reptile is a matchup that can't be missed. It's so popular, in fact, that a remake was released in 2021, and it's also the reason this movie made it this far on the list. Unfortunately, 1962's King Kong vs. Godzilla is considered a bit of a blemish on the series among hardcore fans. Not because it wasn't a good movie, but because it's a symbol of when Godzilla transitioned from existentially terrifying to silly and family-friendly. If you haven't yet seen the modern reboot, you should definitely pop this in the VCR first and witness the original battle between the world's two most beloved monsters. Critics weren't too pleased with Godzilla's most recent solo outing, Godzilla King of the Monsters. Many cite the plot mechanics as tricky and hard to follow, while others claimed the storytelling was worthless and couldn't be saved. However, many fans would be quick to disagree. Sure, the plot and story are suboptimal, but the action and spectacular effects drove audience reviews far into the realm of favorable. There's no man in a rubber suit, so it doesn't offer much in the way of cheesy, classic appeal, but it's undeniably an entertaining two hours. Godzilla, King of the Monsters features plenty of our favorite titans, such as Mothra, Rodan, and the magnificent three-headed menace King Ghidorah, all looking more lifelike than ever. It's a testament to the lasting legacy that Godzilla has cultivated over the years. Long live the king. In an era where the Godzilla franchise had moved toward younger audiences, it was rare to see an installment that pandered to the adult crowd the way the early horror-type entries did. Godzilla vs. Gigan was pretty much the only Godzilla movie from the 70s that adults could say was made for them. The film starts out almost like Jurassic Park. A group of business owners want to summon the world's most fearsome monsters for their own game. 
As you would assume, this doesn't work out, but not in the way you'd think. The businessmen are actually aliens trying to take over Earth by calling on Gigan and King Ghidorah to wreak havoc on the world. The film's highlight is a two-on-two -two fight, with Godzilla and Anguirus battling the two destroyers. Godzilla vs. Gigan is definitely worth watching if you have the time, but like the others up to this point, it probably won't be your favorite. One of the aspects of the Godzilla franchise that made it such a beast over half a century ago is the social commentary with which it packs its best films. This started with the original and has been present on occasion ever since. Often, those that break this precedent are simply action for action's sake with no other redeeming qualities, made solely to entertain and nothing else. Godzilla vs. Hedorah, however, has plenty to say. The plot revolves around the pollution that plagues the Earth, which makes it the perfect target for the smog-sucking monster to drop in from space and muck around. Fortunately for everyone else, Godzilla saves the day, and the world receives a grim reminder of the consequences of their less-than-green practices. The film commonly referred to as Invasion of Astro Monster has gone by three different names, depending on date and location. When you see someone mention Godzilla vs. Astro Monster or Godzilla vs. Monster Zero, they're talking about the same movie. Other than that minor confusion, which doesn't really factor into the quality of the feature, it's pretty good. Since the film is a direct sequel to Ghidorah, the three-headed monster, the fan-favorite character comes back for a second helping. The movie is enjoyable, but not quite as good as the first. Either of these Ghidorah movies could have done without the other, since they have basically the same story. Regardless of whatever name you call it, Invasion of Astro Monster is perfectly watchable, even if it doesn't quite match up to Ghidorah's previous outing. In order to really appreciate the Heisei era of the Godzilla franchise and take in all the fun the 80s and 90s entries have to offer, it's best to view them as a similar yet separate string of films. If you do, you'll likely enjoy Godzilla vs. Biollante, since it's the epitome of this age. Some of Godzilla's cells have been recovered from a volcano, and different groups have different ideas for what to do with them. Naturally, this causes a fight, and the cells ultimately land in the hands of the Japanese military, where they are spliced with rose DNA and mutate into the creature known as Biollante. Naturally, you can guess who Biollante ends up in a big kaiju battle against. Godzilla vs. Biollante has plot, action, and of course, rubber suits, making it a darn good film as far as Godzilla himself is concerned. As for the acting and character development, they're far from perfect, to put it kindly. The first Godzilla movie of the 2020s is certainly a film worth seeing, with some of the best special effects and CGI that money can buy. Some purists might not enjoy the film's sleek Hollywood look, but it's undeniable that Godzilla vs. Kong features some of the most impressive visuals the franchise has to offer. Unfortunately, the movie falls a little flat when it comes to character development and drama. Even though Kong seems to change sizes depending on what's happening in the film, the exciting action and visual direction overshadow any narrative flaws. If you want to see the world's two most famous kaiju duke it out in stunning 4K resolution, this is the movie to watch. King Ghidorah makes any Godzilla movie worth watching, even if said films aren't cinematic masterpieces. When it comes to fun, monstery goodness, King Ghidorah's three heads are hard to beat. As such, Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah is a delightfully cheesy B-movie that exists purely to entertain especially if you watch the English dub. It's a dinosaur! A gigantic dinosaur is attacking our boys! Despite a bizarre time travel storyline, Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah succeeds through delightful special effects and epic monster designs. There's two boss fights for the price of one, as Godzilla's fight against Ghidorah is followed up with an epic battle against Mecha King Ghidorah, an enhanced version of the monster teleported in from the 23rd century. This is the perfect Godzilla film for a midnight movie with a couple of friends and lots of popcorn. Some superfans may see this particular film as problematic within the Godzilla canon, but it's an important piece of the franchise's history. Son of Godzilla is the first time we, well, meet the son of Godzilla. This reptilian child, a clumsy troublemaker named Manila, is a walking embodiment of the light-hearted humor the series was shifting toward at the time. 
In this first appearance, Manila has to help Godzilla defeat a giant spider called Kumanga. Many view the inclusion of Manila as an even further push in a childish direction, and it honestly was. But that doesn't make Son of Godzilla any less of a classic. With the franchise having been built on small sets with big rubber suits from the very beginning, the classics are what it's all about, after all. Destroy All Monsters is generally considered the last good Godzilla film before the franchise went into its 70s slump. The movie is exceedingly fun, if not chaotic, and packs a heavy punch. It has the largest brawl out of any Godzilla film, bringing in 11 of the classic creatures to duke it out. Not all these monsters get the luxury of full screen time, with some only having short cameos, but that doesn't stop the film's final battle from feeling like a tokusatsu version of Avengers Endgame. Viewers have to wade through the movie's slow start to get to the action, but every ounce of patience is worth the wait. It's the last remnant of the good old days going out with a bang. You'll definitely want to watch this particular film with subtitles, though. The English dubbing is pretty awful and hard to follow. Other than the name being an absolute mouthful, Godzilla, Mothra, and King Ghidorah, Giant Monsters All Out Attack is an all-around fantastic film and is easily the best of the millennium era. Fortunately, this movie doesn't feel like an early 21st century garbage heap like most of the others from the time. Instead, we get the man in the green rubber suit and everything. Godzilla is back with a vengeance, infused with the restless spirits of World War II veterans and ready to destroy Japan in retaliation for its crimes. That is, until three powerful guardians come to the country's aid. Baragon, Mothra, and King Ghidorah Even without these fan favorites on screen, the movie Spirit is the political commentary of Godzilla's past, and for that, it weighs in at number 9. The top 10 is highly competitive, and Godzilla vs. Destoroya is no lightweight. In fact, it's the only Godzilla movie to score a perfect 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. The movie was the finale of the Heisei series and brought the era to a banging halt. Godzilla was built up over the course of a decade so he could meet his end in the final moments of this film. The finale to the Heisei era was originally planned to involve Godzilla dueling with the ghost of the 1954 Godzilla, which definitely would have been a showdown to remember. Instead, we got Godzilla having a literal nuclear meltdown while looking like he needs the world's largest tums. That's not to say the film isn't absolutely fantastic, it is, and it's definitely worth checking out. The year was 1984, and the Godzilla franchise had been sitting near death on a nine-year hiatus. The goofiness of the Showa era had put a lot of people off, and if the big guy was going to grace the screen once more, the film would have to be exceptional. Sure enough, it was. The nuclear lizard rose from the sea once again in The Return of Godzilla. The first film of the Heisei era brought the world's favorite kaiju back to its roots. The plot made heavy commentary on the Cold War tensions that had been weighing the world down for years leading up to the film, returning Godzilla to a mature, less childlike format. Not everyone was as happy as they should have been to see the big man back, however. The franchise had laid dormant for years, and there were some cynics who believed it should have stayed that way. Most Godzilla fans, particularly those in Japan, were more than happy to see the radioactive menace make his grand return to the silver screen. There's no denying Ghidorah, the three-headed monster, has flaws when it comes to production quality, and its stature is more a product of nostalgia than anything else. So why is it so high on this list? Well, no other movie in the franchise introduced King Ghidorah. The three-headed creature is one of the most powerful and awesome monsters in the franchise. Not just a city destroyer, but a potentially world-ending threat, and for that alone, this movie shines. That's not to say the film doesn't have other premium qualities, of course. As opposed to the more human-like beasts they'd come to expect, Ghidorah gave fans a truly monstrous monster. As for the human characters, they are surprisingly well-developed and help weave humor effortlessly throughout the tension. Ghidorah, the three-headed monster, earned its spot at number six, and it wasn't given lightly. Godzilla Raids Again was the first Godzilla sequel, released just one year after the original. It proved to be a stunning film in its own right, with a ferocity in its choreography that other kaiju pictures of the day lacked. This was the first Godzilla film to pit the King of Monsters against another creature of its size, specifically the irradiated dinosaur Anguirus. 
Ultimately, the spiked creature isn't powerful enough to take Godzilla down, leaving it up to the humans to save the day once again. For all of its high points, Godzilla Raids Again has its faults when it comes to plot. Most notably, its erasure of Godzilla's death at the end of the first movie. Regardless, its importance to the growth of the franchise truly can't be understated. Despite what some purists might say, entertainment is just as important as historical and intellectual value when it comes to ranking kaiju movies, and the 2014 Godzilla was just about as entertaining as they come. Nobody expected an American Godzilla film with advanced special effects to work. 1998 killed that idea for us. But this movie showed us that one bad apple doesn't ruin a bunch of awesome giant monsters beating the crap out of each other. The way this movie is shot has a lot to do with its quality. Instead of watching monsters rampage in the distance, the 2014 film gave viewers a point of view that made us feel like we were right there, looking up at the carnage. What are you doing? I have to see this. The progression withholds details in just the right amounts, showing us bits and pieces until we're burdened by the crushing weight of a sci-fi horror. The movie was masterfully done in just about every way. We just wish we could have seen a little more Brian Cranston. The best Godzilla movie of the 21st century? Shin Godzilla is not just one of the most entertaining movies about the giant lizard, but also a biting piece of political satire. In this movie, which takes place in an entirely separate continuity from every other Godzilla film, not only is Godzilla upset about being woken up from his decades-long nap, but he's also punishing Japan in retaliation for the Fukushima disaster and humanity's generally irresponsible use of nuclear power. The movie spends a lot of time inside bureaucratic meetings in which the Japanese government tries to manage the crisis, but that never detracts at all from the film's power. Shin Godzilla embodies the soul of Godzilla that seemed to have been lost in the Millennium Era's need for mindless action. Much of Shin Godzilla's success can be attributed to the masterful direction of Hideaki Anno, the creator of the iconic anime series Neon Genesis Evangelion, who presents a disturbing version of Godzilla unlike any other put to screen. Even though Mothra made her first appearance in the 1961 film of the same name, Mothra vs. Godzilla marked the first of many times the giant insect would face the giant lizard in battle. Mothra vs. Godzilla is generally considered the greatest Godzilla installment from its decade, not to mention the second best in the entire series. Comedic overtones mesh with a serious storyline to bring us the underdog fight of a lifetime. Godzilla is a powerhouse bent on raising hell while Mothra is forced to dig deep and use more strength than ever before to save Japan from his destructive rampage. It's a classic story of overcoming evil, but with two giant monsters and all the cutting-edge effects the early 60s could muster. The human storyline isn't quite as good, but that's something Godzilla fans have come to expect over the years. You're probably not surprised to see the first-ever Godzilla movie at the top of the list. And why would you be? Ishiro Honda's Godzilla is the film that sparked more than 65 years of sequels, reboots, and series based on the King of Monsters. Regardless of its follow-ups, however, the very first Godzilla was a powerful piece raised high on its own merit. Movie critic Roger Ebert called Godzilla, quote, the Fahrenheit 9-11 of its time. And for good reason. Godzilla was created as a response to American radiation testing in Pacific waters as well as the lasting effects of the nuclear bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. The movie was a warning about nuclear technology in the hands of human beings and the destructive force that such a power could have if used incorrectly. Sure, the movie can look a bit silly at times, as many sci-fi movies from the 50s do, but its concept is utterly brilliant setting a precedent for other Godzilla stories to speak out about human folly in all its forms. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movie monsters are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.